So I'd like to talk this evening about uh, something actually not very popular. Uh, I'd like to talk about renunciation. Actually, I'd like to talk about renunciation and joy. And uh, just uh, was having tea in the manager's dining room and one of the managers asked me what I was going to talk about and I said, renunciation and joy. And she said, that's an odd pairing. Uh, so we don't often, it's not two words that we, if we think about renunciation at all, uh, often not two words that we tend to put together. I'd like to explore a little bit uh, what, what that means. <clears throat> so when the Buddha was uh, awakened, uh, the story goes, uh, he spent a little time th- reflecting on how he could best uh, show other people, direct other people to a similar awakening. And so he re- spent, I think it was six weeks, reflecting on this. Actually, probably spent his lifetime reflecting on it. But, uh, and he came up with uh, the Eightfold Path. So what are the things that we need to think about? What are the things that we need to develop to reflect on? And I heard about this, I think, in the first Dharma talk that I ever heard, the Eightfold Path. And I thought, great. And it wasn't until about 15 years later um, that I uh, learned that actually renunciation was part of the Eightfold Path. It's tucked away in a sort of, um, you know, dusty corner that doesn't get, get uh, much exposure. But it is a factor of the path. And I think it's interesting um, what our reactions to renunciation are, it, are as, as lay people, because we're not monastics. And so uh, on, on the very small number of occasions when I've talked about renunciation sometimes to people, uh, you, sort of, you can almost hear them groan when, when, uh, <laughs> when you say you're going to talk about them. And the eye, you know, the eyes go to the door, a furtive glance, maybe they can... Uh, make a quick dash for it before I start talking. (laughs) Um, So it's just interesting to see what the reactions are. Uh, Often often we just hear about renunciation as a kind of, just no, no, I don't want to know. There's a kind of horror or just a non-consideration of it. Uh, It's not really anything I'm interested in, don't want to go near. Is that on the one hand, or... Uh, we tend, we might get into a thing. Oh, you know, um, I'm not. I guess I'm not really practicing unless I live in, you know, a cave in the Himalayas or or uh, wear nothing but a loincloth for whatever, or stand on one leg for years or something. It's just, just point. Well, it's, it's kind of pointless. I'm not really doing it. So, if if anything, what I want to do tonight is is not lay down what the should should be, but just ask, can this question be open for us? Can it be an alive question that each, each of us is asking for ourselves in an ongoing way? What does it mean for me? What might it mean? Why is it important? What's its place in my life? So, not any kind of should about, should be like this, should live like that, whatever. Um... And I feel very much that it's important to ask, ask these questions because uh, there is, I feel, a very real connection between renunciation and, and the heart. So this question of renunciation has everything to do with openness of heart, with our capacity to love and our capacity for joy. So this this renunciation is something that actually runs again, as I was talking last night. It's one of the qualities that runs through all the really deep uh, spiritual and mystical traditions. So certainly, if you look in uh, the teachings of Jesus, there's uh, ample uh, ample gravity given to to renunciation. So there's the famous story of uh, uh, a certain young man coming to him and asking, what, what do I need to do to open to the kingdom of heaven? 
And the first thing, actually, interestingly, Jesus says to him is, basically, he goes through a list, follow the precepts, you know, look, look after your, how you're living in relation to others. And uh, the, the young man said, actually, I, I already live that way. And then I find a very beautiful line that says, uh, and then Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And, it's, uh, and then he says, you're lacking one thing. Go and give away your possessions to the poor and then come. And it says the young man uh, was very rich and actually his face fell, got very sad and just left because he knew he couldn't do it. And then Jesus turned to his uh, disciples, and it, that's, I think, the instant that he said it's easier for a uh, rich man, no, it's easier for uh, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is, is quite an extremist uh, as a teacher, but uh, it's there in, 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 in all traditions. I wonder why is it we we brush it aside so easily. I remember um, quite some years ago, I was in America and talking to a person very involved in New Age kind of stuff, and he said, all, all that renunciation, that's, that's from the past. We've evolved now. Humanity has evolved, and we don't, we don't need that anymore. It's a lower form of spirituality. Now we have enlightenment in Bloomingdale's. So if you know Bloomingdale's, is like, uh, it's like the Harrods of New York, sort of Selfridges. And that was like a, a higher form of spirituality. And I said, here, son, have a cigar. And <laughs> he didn't actually say that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's so, so easy we dismiss it and we can make kind of uh, excuses uh, or, or justifications to ourselves. Can it be an open question? Because it is there in the teachings of the Buddha. It is there in the teachings of Jesus. It is there if we... Uh, Look at the poetry of Rumi, you know, beautiful, the, the, the poetry of mystical love, and yet it's full, full of these uh, encouragements towards renunciation. So sometimes we hear spiritual teachings and we have a tendency to take what we like and sort of leave what doesn't feel like it suits us. Uh, but Perhaps in that we're, we're uh, letting the sort of status quo of our lives go unchallenged. Having spent uh, some time in monasteries uh, in different parts of the world and talking to the monks and nuns, uh, in certain traditions, it's my experience, it's quite common to uh, for them to enter the monastery and have this period of sort of furious renunciation for oftentimes for years, and it kind of builds up uh, this sort of machismo around renunciation, and then hopefully for for many of them after a while they sort of realise this is I've completely got hold of the wrong end of the stick. So often for monastics they grab hold of it as an end in itself, and. Then so it's not an end in itself, and it's also not, uh, it's not something to pump up the self-image with. So, you know, I can fast for X days more than you can, which is actually quite quite common uh, attitude. Well, the Buddha said something like, uh, when I, he said, my heart at first did not leap at a leap up at the thought of renunciation. He realized it was a good idea, but he wasn't exactly, you know, yippeeing about it. Uh, I had to consider, uh, he said, I had to consider the drawbacks of indulgence. And I had to consider the, um, the benefits of renunciation. So even for the Buddha, uh, I had to really, not, not an easy one to begin to question. So actually, what is renunciation? What, what, what is it? Um, again, it's interesting as the Dharma develops in, in the West how, how often there are sort of new definitions of renunciation, a little bit uh, sort of more cushy and more comfortable. I just, I just want to, hopefully we can have it as an open question, a really honest question. Can we bring uh, a, a kind of total honesty 
to, the, to these spiritual questions. So if I had to define it, I suppose I would say it's a kind of giving up or cutting down or letting go of certain pleasures in order to uh, experience a higher meaning or to accomplish a more meaningful goal, a more important goal. So actually, everyone right here, just by virtue of being here, being on retreat, we're, we're involved in renunciation. Uh, you know, come Saturday night, match of the day is going to be on, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to be here. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of renunciation going on. You know, the food is very lovely, uh, but there's not much choice. You basically eat what's there. We share bathrooms, you may be sharing a room. You know, there's this uh, renunciation of the schedule. Can't really choose so much what to do at a certain times. So renunciation, we're involved in it right now. For the sake, as I said last night, for the sake of freedom, for the sake of love, for the sake of something that's more important. So you could say, well, you know, going to the gym, that's sacrificing something for, for another goal or for a better goal or dieting. Uh, but in the Dharma sense, that's not, uh, that's not really really the same because uh, dieting, for example, often comes basically from uh, often neurotic concern with one's self-image, with one's attractiveness. It's bound up in a circle of something that is not leading in any way to freedom. It's actually leading to a deepening of the kind of constriction of self, of self-view, of uh, imprisonment to cultural values, etc., it's leading in the opposite way of freedom. So someone pointed out to me, people don't fast so much anymore, they diet uh, nowadays. But renunciation is something that moves us towards freedom. That's, that's, that's what's key. Moves, moves towards freedom, moves towards joy, moves towards love. It's also not a question of... Um, of self-control, like we're trying to master ourselves in some feat of uh, of willpower or something. That's not that's not the purpose of renunciation. So, to bring an intelligence into our spiritual path, if we're taking on certain practices, why? It's for freedom, for love. It's not not for anything else. Anything else is missing the point. Some of the pleasures we let go of are not just the sort of obvious sense pleasures, but also the kind of the pleasure of pumping oneself up, of uh, identifying with a role. I'm Mr. Big Shot or Mrs. Big Shot. Uh, this is my important role in life, or power I might have over someone else. So these are also there's a certain pleasure to that kind of thing, but that also is uh, in the realm of what is to be uh, renounced, really if the path is to move deeply. And of course, uh, renunciation nowadays, it's obvious, has everything to do with the fate of, of the earth, the fate of the planet, the fate of billions of people. And I don't need to... I mean, everyone's quite aware of uh, the statistics and figures of what the implications are of having a certain... <clears throat> level of uh, con- consumption, etc. But the uh, intention of compassion as something that fuels renunciation, very important, very connected. And more than that, and what I want to go into in this talk, is renunciation has everything to do with opening to joy and opening to uh, some deeper aspect of life which may not otherwise be, be so available to us. So I was reading a while ago, I think it was in Resurgence magazine, which is a magazine that's uh, sort of about spirituality and uh, environmentalism. And there was an article called uh, The Religion of Consumerism. And there's a quote from it, it said, quite interesting, the fact that societies of high consumption tend to be highly secular is not likely an accident. The fact that societies of high consumption tend to be highly secular is not likely an accident. 
So we tend to think of sort of second and third world countries a bit backward because they don't have a lot of stuff. And people live quite simply, and they also have all these crazy beliefs, quite religious or spiritual oriented beliefs. And we've sort of moved on from that in the West. What has replaced culturally the uh, spiritual urge, the spiritual hunger? Sometimes we don't even realize it, but it is actually uh, consumerism, consumption, satisfying uh, those kind of uh, desires has actually taken the place of a deeper hunger. And one of those two is going to eat the other, basically. So if we think about the path, uh, and we think about factors of the path, and there's all these lists in Buddhist teaching, you know, seven of this and eight of that and four of this and whatnot. And uh, renunciation is one of them. But these other factors of the path, actually they have... Uh, a mutual, f- mutually feeding relationship with renunciation. So what that means is that developing renunciation, inquiring into that, opening to that, actually feeds, develops our equanimity, our love, our joy, our mindfulness, our calmness, etc., uh, etc. Et and similarly, equanimity, mindfulness, joy, calmness, all that feeds nourishes our capacity for renunciation. So that kind of um, two-way causality is really common in the Dharma. In uh, positive qualities tend to feed each other. We think about what what are some of the outcomes of renunciation. Uh, If we begin, if we take the risk, and it is a risk actually, to explore this either in small ways or in large ways in our lives. What, what might we uh, feel safe to expect? Well, one thing is spaciousness. Spaciousness. And how precious a commodity that is in our lives. Uh, I don't know if humans were always uh, that way, but especially nowadays, such uh, crammed full minds, crammed full lives. If, if we can uh, experiment with simplifying somewhat, not needing to fulfill all those desires, then there can be a spaciousness that opens up. And all the beauty of that. And spaciousness is something that actually a part of us yearns for, it longs for it. We feel burdened by the weight and the pressure, the constriction of uh, or all this busyness, all this chasing around. So we yearn for it. At the same time, it's quite, uh, it might be quite fearful. Our sense of identity may be wrapped up in that busyness, may be wrapped up in the accumulation. What would I do? Who would I be? I'm not used to space. So we have a very ambivalent relationship with space, the spaciousness. That kind of lightness of being, it's really, uh, it's something that comes with the path anyway. So we're moving in that direction, this lightness of being, instead of feeling burdened and and heavy. And as an aspect of that, uh, renunciation is giving up, also brings, of course, simplicity and clarity. So, to actually know, to know that we're seeing life Clearly, we're seeing life deeply. How oh, that's so important. We talk about opening to wisdom and cultivating that. Not possible if we're not seeing clearly. If we're not seeing deeply. If there isn't the the space to to allow that. So that allows an honesty of what it is to be human. That we're not so caught up in. Uh, Acquiring and uh, you know indulging in this and that and experiencing this and that and that that we've forgotten as we were talking earlier in the question answer period we've forgotten about death. I mean, death is going to be basically an end to all that acquiring, all that running around. We're f- f- living sometimes all this. Uh, 
acquisition and indulgence is actually completely fogging the view, completely filling up uh, our sense of what life is. So we're actually not in contact with what it really honestly is to be alive, which is that it's going to end in death. Has, renunciation has everything to do with our capacity for, for a really deep honesty. And as I said, uh, what, so there's spaciousness, simplicity, clarity, honesty. And as I said before, love, and the, the heart, and the relationship of the heart to renunciation. So, as one teacher put it, how can there be a strong and continuous flow outwards from the heart in giving, in care, if there's so much uh, focus and uh, energy going into taking in. There's not room. There's not the space. So this, our ability to give, our our, uh, capacity to remain open, has everything to do with this question of renunciation. And our happiness, our joy, has everything to do with our capacity to have an open heart, to give. It has everything to do with that. So this kind of deep love, this deep kindness and compassion that we talk about in the Dharma, service, the will to serve, they are... Uh, dependent on renunciation at a certain level and dependent on that kind of space. So if we're interested in really transforming our life, really transforming the heart, have to inquire into this. So spaciousness, simplicity, clarity, honesty, love, confidence, confidence. So, without even realizing it, how much of our lack of confidence in our ability to to feel okay, to be happy, is wrapped up in our uh, connection with things and goods and acquiring, acquiring pleasures. So what happens with the practice of renunciation, we actually develop a very deep and unshakable confidence that we can be, really feel okay, big okay, big happiness, uh, much less dependent on outer circumstances. Much less dependent. You know, some people who have been on long, long retreats uh, say to me, you know, it, it seems like actually all I need is a cushion and a blanket and, and a little food. <laughs> and I'm, I'm set. You know, and a roof over my head when it's... Uh, and it's just the sense. It's sort of pared down everything. And the sense, unshakable. Oh, I understand now. I don't actually need all that stuff. The confidence of heart that gives inside uh, is really uh, a treasure. We don't realize how much of our lives are oriented, uh, eaten away by the kind of fears about will we be okay if da 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 isn't there, if I can't have access to if da 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 da. Oftentimes don't even realize that level of fear going on. Sensitivity is another aspect. So there's something about this whole path that moves towards a deepening sensitivity. Really, really important. When we indulge, and it's it's not uh, any great mystery. It's something. All this is something to be experimented with. So you can experiment when we uh, indulge uh, or overindulge. Uh, what happens to the sensitivity of being? Does it get dulled? What happens to our joy and our capacity for joy when our sensitivity is dulled? Question. Question to explore, to know for oneself. What happens to our sense of spiritual urgency? Our sense of there's something uh, deep available in life. There's something deep. There's beautiful, deep, rich things available to all of us. And sometimes we feel that and we feel it deeply, as a deep hunger, and sometimes it gets clouded over, it gets dulled, because the sensitivity is dulled. 
what dulls it? Indulgence and that kind of uh, being caught up in acquisition, that, that tends to dull that kind of urgency. And we need that drive. So I feel it's important to have a sense of uh, the depths of life that are that's available for us. Have a sense of life being something deep. And that sense, not just being an isolated sense, two, three, four times in their life, which actually is often the case for people. Live their whole lives and they think, you know, Castro, I remember 25 years ago I looked up at the sky and something, something, and something opened. Beautiful. Why does it have to be so, so long ago? Can that actually be more, more of something... Uh, more of a regular sense, we really feel nourished by. This is, this is so possible. It's so possible. Uh, the, the teacher, the Indian teacher Krishnamurti, uh, has this quote, it's quite harsh sounding, but uh, he said, um, we come to the infinite well of life with a thimble, and so we go away thirsty. So it's quite a strong statement, but basically saying, are we, are we asking enough of life? Why, why is it that we end up settling for something much less than what's actually the in, infinite nature of what's available? And we, we think somehow, well, I'm not, it's not for me, or just the comfort and the convenience of things. It, we, ten, we tend to get sidetracked and we settle for something much less. Why? So one of the things, and you can see it on the retreat, definitely you can see it on the retreat, one of the things that renunciation begins to do, that being here begins to do, is it begins to reconnect us with our life. Really, and this is the emphasis of mindfulness I've been talking about, really to feel alive, to know that we're living. Connects us with our earthiness, our physicality. We are human beings. If we pamper ourselves too much, we actually lose connection with what it is to have a body. And all that that means, and the beauty of that, pain and pleasure. Reconnects us. It has the capacity to reconnect us, to enable us to reconnect. So, so, so much... Uh, that's sold, so much that's available to us in the culture and probably throughout history is actually uh, consciously and unconsciously uh, engineered, manufactured, produced, sold to make us a little bit numb, comfortably numb. Uh, Just a little bit nice, 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 good, just, yeah, 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 go to sleep, it's okay. (laughs) And we like that, part of us likes that. Uh, But what's the cost? What's the cost? So, the cost is actually our joy, our capacity for joy. And spiritual joy, some sense of something deeper in life. Just sense of something more uh, deeply available to us, whatever name you want to give that. So uh, Rumi, the uh, Sufi poet, mystical poet, has a lovely poem, short poem. And when he when he talks, uh, when he says "you" in in uh, his writings and his poems, he's talking about this deeper sense that's available to human being, sense of God, you might say, sense of just something that is, uh, in a way, ultimately fulfilling. <coughs> So he says, when it's cold and raining, you are more beautiful, and the snow brings me even closer to your lips. The inner secret, that which was never born, you are that freshness, and I am with you now. I can't explain the goings or the comings, you enter (coughs) suddenly, and I am nowhere again inside the majesty. So I remember uh, one of my teachers saying, 
if it is cold and rainy outside, we had a lovely day today, but who knows, this is England. Uh, if it's cold and rainy outside and you see you don't feel like going for a walk, go for a walk. Why? Because it's actually, what's actually going on there, and we don't realize that something in the heart is closed a little bit. It's just closed, our receptivity is closed a little bit. So we don't feel like it. Go for a walk and encourage the heart to open, allow the heart to open. He said, if you're hungry, sometimes, don't eat. If you're tired, if it's late and you're tired, or if you're tired and it's not late, don't go to sleep. Stay up. Stay up when you're tired. Again, no shoulds here. Like, can you, it's, it's a radical... Awakening is something radical. It's something completely that turns everything inside out and on its head. All the values, all the cultural values, all our predispositions, it just is back to front. And sometimes it needs a back to front approach. So no shoulds, but can we even have the willingness, the openness to, to maybe even think about questioning or experimenting? So it's interesting to me, I touched on this last night, um, we, we want to be happy, everyone wants to be happy, it's part of the human condition, a very wonderful thing, but it's actually quite rare, I think, for people to be passionately dedicated to happiness. It's actually it's quite rare to meet someone who's completely devoted to happiness, and everything that that means. I remember... Um, I remember I used to, when I lived in the States, there was a, a meditation center, and we would have these ongoing classes meet every week. And for a period of time, we did this exercise of investigating the different kinds of happiness that there are available. So whatever it is, a nice meal, a sunset, someone saying, hey, you look great today, or you did a good job, or uh, the feelings in meditation, or the joy of giving, or kindness... The whole range, just to be open and really to bring a open questioning to the whole spectrum, the whole range of depths of, of happiness, all the different kinds of happiness. And pleasure, the different ranges of pleasure. And to begin just to no- notice the whole way it all works, the progress of happiness. Some happiness is a very short-lived, extremely short-lived. Some happinesses are quite long-lived. I remember about a couple of years ago working in India at a leprosy community. One of my jobs there was was playing with the blind and the deaf children. There were two schools within this leprosy community. The kids didn't have leprosy, but they were blind and deaf. And one of my jobs in the afternoon was to just play with them. We had nothing. We had a, a little sponge ball, and that was it. And we would make up games. And uh, it was it was lovely. It was absolutely, really, a complete privilege. And even still, when I reflect on that, and reflect of, on having been part of that, uh, it there's happiness there. There's the joy there. Now, earlier today, I had a chocolate-covered rice uh, cracker. <laughs> And I'm reflecting on that right now. And there's not much, <laughs> not much in the way of joy going on. So, just to really, can we really bring a real investigation to happiness and what it means? There are different kinds of pleasure. There are different kinds of happiness. Are we committed to happiness? Noticing how does happiness come? How does it last? How does it dissolve? And similarly, uh, interesting, this exploration of happiness, this exploration of joy, the kind of expectations that we have around what's going to give us that sense of joy and what maybe isn't. So um, years ago, in another life, no, not in another life, I shouldn't say that. Um, Years ago, I was working as a composer, as a musician, and um, living in the States, and... Uh, sort of getting by, you know. And uh, sort of out of the blue, a very 
uh, very well-known orchestra decided that it would play one of my pieces. So this was a big piece and a huge, like, wow. And all my community of musician friends and other friends said, fantastic, you know, what a great career break, blah, 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 blah. And um, I remember they flew me to the place of the concert and all this, and uh, it was a complete uh, disappointment. I mean, there was all this excitement about it, but the actual fact of it was, I mean, for different reasons, it was it was uh, not enough rehearsal time, this, that. So something that there was a great expectation of happiness uh, from actually didn't deliver. It ended up being actually a very stressful experience with uh, not enough rehearsal time. And after I got back, I think it was a day or two later, I uh, was doing my laundry and uh, took it to the laundromat about five minutes walk away carrying my laundry and uh, I think I was coming back with my my you know uh, laundry and sun was shining came through the clouds and just uh, the light falling on the houses on the street falling on the trees falling on the houses carrying my laundry plodding along <laughs> and just something in me open it's just it was just hap- the presence was there I was present, I was connected. The simplest, most mundane thing. And there was this happiness that welled up. So that ex- just to, to, to begin to trace and investigate expectations of happiness and, and what actually does give happiness. Where does happiness, where does joy come from? So these questions are really, really important for us to ask, to inquire into joy. And we can get so clear about the answers that no matter what advertising says what, no matter who offers you what money, no matter what teacher says what, we're actually clear, actually really clear about where happiness comes from and where it doesn't come from, where it's just a waste of energy. And we can be unshakably clear about that. Often our assumptions and beliefs about happiness, we we don't actually deeply examine them. So just an invitation there. What is it that feeds joy and a sense of spiritual joy? So being in nature, that connection with nature, which is actually free, you know. No one owns the stars, no one owns the moonlight. I heard a while ago, actually, uh, McDonald's Corporation uh, made a bid to send up huge satellites that would uh, have very bright lights and make this huge golden arches M in the night sky. <laughs> and uh, I don't know who it was, but they were they were declined permission. <laughs> uh, but this is actually it's free. You know, the things that are free are often the things that are most deeply fulfilling. qualities of heart that give rise to joy, love, sense of community, the joy that comes from community. So we think sometimes of renunciation as a sacrifice, I'm giving up this and then it's like, you know, uh, what am I, you know, what am I, okay, what am I going to sacrifice? But actually, can we turn the question on its head? Am I, what am I willing to sacrifice? Am I willing to sacrifice my uh, capacity for joy? Am I, is that really something that I'm get, I want to go through my life having sacrificed because I am caught up in something else, in the momentum of something else? So really, what am I willing to sacrifice? One of the things that aids renunciation, that gives it, uh, gives us courage to renounce, is is wisdom, is insight. That's uh, one of the fruits of insight. And so we begin to see, as practice deepens, as we become more more aware, more sensitive, that to grasp on to anything, 
to try and hold it, grab it, me, I want. That very motion is a contraction of being. And we begin to become so sensitive that we can feel uh, even the most subtle uh, grasping. We begin to feel the suffering involved in that. Now, some graspings are uh, so obvious in their suffering. But actually, all grasping, all movement of grasping is felt as suffering. And the mindfulness can actually become so uh, alive, so sensitive, that we're aware of the barest movement of grasping. And we know, it's very clear, unmistakably clear, grasping and suffering are uh, actually one and the same. So to begin to inquire into grasping and its impacts in our life, on all kinds of levels. And then as we talked in the question and answer period today, the contemplation of impermanence. So we spend so much energy chasing this and that and trying to get, just to remember, to reflect repeatedly on its impermanence. So I won't go into it again here now. But also, as I said earlier, are we living knowing about death? Are we living remembering death? All this acquiring, all this grasping, all this getting, all this brief sense pleasure, it's in the context of death. Now that sounds terribly grey and morbid maybe, but actually it's not, as we touched on earlier in the question and answer. Something that gives a beauty, a preciousness, a meaning, uh, a vibrancy, a brilliance to our life, to the moment. Can we live remembering death? Can we reflect too that a lot of the stuff we chase is actually empty of value? You know, with maybe a uh, a necklace or a ring or something or whatever. It has no inherent value. It's just society has agreed that these things are supposedly wonderful or a certain car or the way it looks or, or whatever may actually not be so uh, brainwashed by that. Or the social conventions. And oftentimes to begin also to see the emptiness in, an, in another way. When there is a sense of peace, okayness, uh, openness, love, is there then a sense of uh, some little pleasure, some little acquisition. How important does that seem? When I don't feel so okay inside myself, then then there's the need. Then I go out to grab, to get. The value that I invest, the value that a thing appears to have, is dependent on how my heart is. Heart okay, heart wide, heart open, little value out there, in that sense. Heart afraid, closed, feeling impoverished, all the things I need. See that. There's no inherent value in things. And you see things that we uh, tend to think I own, I own this, I own a house, I own this. Is there really even such a thing as ownership? So actually, uh, all it can ever be is just moments of impressions of something in awareness. I say I own I own this watch or I own a car or I own a house. It's actually a myth. There's a myth to ownership. All, all that's happening is there's moments of awareness where there's, you know, visual sense of some bricks or something. Where's, where's the ownership really? It's a, it's a myth. If we go deep, if we see deep in meditation, We might want to ask ourselves sometimes in quiet times or to, in a way, reflect ahead uh, onto our deathbed or the moment of our death and to actually ask a very deep question and say, what forces uh, have been or are really driving my life? 
it's not, not an easy question to ask. Uh, is it forces towards uh, comfort, convenience, security, certain amount of sense of pleasure? Or is it, is it uh, a drive, a current towards, towards love, towards freedom? How would we feel on our deathbed, looking back and realizing that actually, mm, you know, most of the current was really about well, being comfortable, being safe, being secure? How would we feel in that moment? And you can't go back then and change it. Not an easy question. So, just to raise all this as, as possibilities for questioning, possibilities for experimenting. Do we dare to experiment here? Do we dare to challenge our habits, to challenge our assumptions, our beliefs about what it is that we need? Uh, and actually, actually say, hmm, I wonder what it would be to just eat bland food for three months? I don't know, just a figure, but just uh, a possibility. Um, I, because of health reasons, I was actually, uh, that was something I actually had to do for, for about nine months, I think. And, um, and I, me- I remember at first, it was, I was here, and it was quite challenging. I remember one occasion in particular, it was someone's birthday, and the managers bought out these two huge uh, trays of chocolate cake. <laughs> I'm very keen on chocolate. And, uh, and sort of plonked it down, and, <laughs> and I was on this sort of uh, plain tofu, plain rice, and, and plain steamed vegetables diet <laughs> for nine months. And it was very hard at first, you know, and all that, then self pity comes and you're saying, you know, <laughs> But after a while, I really began to see this connection between if I feel okay, as I said, if there is a sense of inner well being, that stuff really, really doesn't have the same impact. What would it be, and not necessarily with food, but just with something to, to actually deliberately challenge and see? So mindfulness, we talk about mindfulness and sensitivity. They are uh, acquired tastes, in a way. So usually we look for our sense of fulfillment in either something really exciting, uh, um, some big event or something, or or in, in pleasure. Actually, there's something that I think people who practice a while, it's almost like mindfulness itself becomes something, it's a very delicate kind of pleasure, very lovely kind of pleasure. The sensitivity of the being is something that we come to really cherish. Much more uh, than uh, getting or some big, you know, uh, bungee jumping off the Eiffel Tower naked with a glass of champagne or whatever. It's, it's overrated. So. <laughs> uh, begin to develop deeper tastes and a much deeper sense of fulfillment. And similarly to, to actually, uh, I feel great, great benefit in hanging out sometimes with people who, who have deliberately chosen a life of simplicity, either lay people who are doing that, or monastics, or uh, religious people. Just what, 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 something that rubs off, something we see. Look at that person, has absolutely nothing, and they, they're beaming all the time. What's going on? And here am I who have this, this, and this, and whatnot, and all this choice, and uh, I'm struggling. That's really the impact, as the Buddha says, to, to um, he calls it association with the wise. So, say so association with the renunciates. Really, really wonderful thing. Or uh, to come together as sangha and to explore this question together, to support each other in these kind of questions. What would it be to simplify our lives? How can we do that? How can we support each other in that? How can we brainstorm and make that something real? The enormous power of, uh, of community, of people coming together and supporting each other in these questions. So really just all, all of the main point was just to, to can, it, can we at least be willing to have the question be alive? 
And it may be possible that a preoccupation with comfort, preoccupation with convenience, with sense pleasure, with security, it may be that it closes the flow, closes our access to uh, much deeper and wider emotions. And I don't just mean emotions around self-story and my history and my trouble. I mean uh, much wider maybe the kind of emotional life that we're actually not even that familiar with. It may be that there's something about that kind of preoccupation that actually just uh, collapses that avenue a little bit, collapses that opening. I just want to finish. There's a, a really beautiful poem by Mary Oliver. This is really what she's talking about. She says, Am I not among the early risers and the long-distance walkers? Have I not stood amazed as I consider the perfection of the morning star above the peaks of the houses and the crowns of the trees blue in the first light? Do I not see how the trees tremble as though sheets of water flowed over them, though it is only wind, that common thing, free to everyone and everything? Have I not thought for years what it would be worthy to do, and then gone off barefoot and with a silver pail to gather blueberries, thus coming, as I think, upon a right answer? What will ambition do for me that the fox appearing suddenly at the top of the field, her eyes sharp and confident as she stared into mine, has not already done. What countries, what visitations, what pomp would satisfy me as thoroughly as Blackwater Woods on a sun-filled morning, or equally in the rain? Here is an amazement. Once I was twenty years old, And in every motion of my body there was a delicious ease. And in every motion of the green earth there was a hint of paradise. And now I am sixty years old, and it is the same. Above the modest house and the palace, the same darkness. Above the evil man and the just, the same stars. Above the child who will recover, and the child who will not recover, the same energies roll forward from one tragedy to the next and from one foolishness to the next. I bow down. Have I not loved as though the beloved could vanish at any moment or become preoccupied or whisper a name other than mine in the stretched curvatures of lust or over the dinner table? Have I ever taken good fortune for granted? Have I not, every spring, befriended the swarm that pours forth? Have I not summoned the honey man to come, to hurry, to bring with him the white and comfortable hive? And, while I waited, have I not leaned close to see everything? Have I not been stung as I watched their milling and gleaming, and stung hard? Have I not been ready always at the iron door, not knowing to what country it opens, to death or to more life? Have I ever said that the day was too hot or too cold, or the night too long and as black as oil anyway, or the morning washed blue and emptied entirely of the second rate less than happiness? As I stepped down from the porch, and set out along the green paths of the world. Thank you for listening.